Okay guys, so remember you were supposed to go through some of these uh, various terms trying to find and come up with an example for them. So just really quickly before we get into the next part here. Solute, remember that is the substance that is being dissolved. It can be solid, it can be liquid, it can be gas. Remember solids would be things like sugar or table salt, um, iced tea powder, Kool-Aid, you name it. We're dissolving those in some sort of other solvent. We can dissolve liquids like alcohols or gases like carbon dioxide to make our pop. So we can dissolve any state into uh, particular solvents. Solvent, remember, that's the one that's doing the dissolving. And then the ratio of solute to solvent ultimately makes for us the solution. And we are going to learn to describe that as something that is known as concentration. We can figure out if we make a dilute solution like you know, half a spoonful of iced tea powder in a glass of water, or we can make a concentrated solution where we put like three or four and hopefully are able to dissolve all of that to make that, you know, delicious syrupy iced tea uh, glass that you're craving. All right, uh, homogeneous, all right, remember the Latin prefix uh, homo just means the same. So a homogeneous solution would be something that looks the same throughout. You wouldn't be able to identify the different parts. Heterogeneous, hetero means different. And so a heterogeneous solution, you'd be able to see the different parts within it. Miscible, when you were looking at that one, was really just the ability to dissolve. All right, so hopefully you were able to get some of uh, those examples and those terms are starting to mean something for us. Again, remember for especially Lab 5A, you need to be able to differentiate between conductivity and non-conductivity. So something that is an electrolyte or not, that can help start to identify what you might have. And then, of course, the other second test that must be done determines acidic, acidity, basicity, or neutrality. And so, again, practice some of that in 195, and then that should help you for 5A. All right, so we're into la our section 5.2 here. We want to be able to explain solutions. And there's two main terms that we're trying to take from this particular section here. All right, that is going to be... Identifying ions in solutions, so this is your conductivity versus non-conductivity, electrolyte versus non-electrolyte, and where these ions are ultimately coming from through two processes known as dissociation or ionization. So, a little bit of background here for us. All right, when we were first identifying uh, various solutions and early chemists were playing with them, such as Svante Arrhenius, he could not quite explain why certain solutions were able to conduct electricity and other solutions were not. What he ultimately uh, was able to find for us was that the conductivity of solutions was due to the presence of charged particles, which you know, called ions. All right, so if we can get ions into the solution, this solution can conduct electricity. So why don't most molecular solutions conduct, but ionic solutions do? Well, your hint is already in the name. Ionic solutions are made up of ions. All right, so they have them there. We just have to get them into the solution. On page 197, you'll find it's a nice, uh, nicer diagram in color than it is here on my black and white notes, but you can see that water is the solvent doing the dissolving. And if I try and dissolve glucose or sorry, sucrose molecules or table sugar, you can see that water does surround it all right, it actually pulls all the individual molecules of sucrose apart and takes it from solid to aqueous state. But in none of this process does it produce any positives or negatives, which would be those ionic charges we needed for an electrolyte solution. Watch what happens to table salt on the other hand. Water will start to attract to the positive and negative ions of sodium and chloride, and it'll start to surround it, but you'll notice that your polar uh, water molecule surrounds sodiums and surrounds negative chlorides with the different partial positive and negative areas surrounding this. So when we take a look at a soluble salt, like table salt, one thing is it will dissolve, but water actually pulls the ions apart. So once the dissolving is done, you've been pulled into two different parts, the positive sodium and the negative chloride. This is a process known as dissociation. So what this means for us, and what your takeaway is on this one, is that molecular compounds and soluble ionic compounds 
kind of dissolve differently. While well, water is able to dissolve a great variety of both molecules and ionic compounds, it can, when it does dissolve ionic compounds, pull it apart and isolate the individual ions, leaving positive and negative ions in the solution. Therefore, we now have something that can be an electrolyte. So, Arrhenius suggested that when these particles were being dissolved, non-electrolytes dispersed neutral particles, like the sugar, and electrolytes dispersed the individual ions, positive and negative parts, allowing for a conductive solution. So there are two parts, there are two ways in which we can produce these ions, and these are two important terms that you need to know. One is called dissociation, the other one is ionization. Both give us ions in the end, it's just how we get them. So dissociation. This is the pro uh, process by which a soluble, dissolvable ionic compound separates into its respective cations and anions. In other words, in dissociation, the ions are already pro uh, present before we dissolve that substance. It's just the process of dissolving it separates out those individual ions and makes for us the ions in solution that will give us our uh, conductive solution. So if we take a look at it, and we kind of, kind of shortcut this, if I want to take a look at what's happening to potassium chloride, potassium chloride is an ionic salt. All right, potassium has a plus one, chloride has a minus one. We remember this from nomenclature. And so what ends up happening here, all right, is that I have to dissolve potassium chloride in water. So I'm trying to make an aqueous solution of it. But ionic salts get pulled apart into the respective ions. So we actually don't get KCl aqueous. What ends up happening is we end up getting potassium ions in solution and chloride ions in solution. So this is our dissociation equation. A one-to-one -one ratio between cations and anions will produce one part potassium ions and one part chloride ions in solution. We tend to ignore the dissolving part when we take a look at ionic compounds or we look at these equations. So KCl or soluble salts can't exist in aqueous form because water actually pulls them apart into individual ions. Interesting to think about it. This means I can't actually give you a glass of salt water because the salt not only dissolves, it gets broken apart into its cation and anion. So it's just a soup of ions rather than salt water. The salt completely breaks apart if it dissolves. The only difference then between dissociation and ionization is that in ionization, if you look at the term, ionization means to make brand new ions. This primarily happens with hydrogen and our acids. Ionization involves a reaction with water that we will have to take a closer look at later on in the chapter. But ultimately, this explains why some neutral molecular compounds can form conductive solutions. These ones typically are your acids and weak bases. All right, your neutral molecular compounds tend not to form these new ions. So, in other words, we didn't have any ions before you tried to dissolve this thing. We just ended up making new ones. So for this, we do have to recognize things such as our acids, molecular hydrogen chloride. All right, hydrogen chloride is a gas. Hydrogen chloride is molecular. We know hydrogen is a nonmetal. So if I was to dissolve this, I would make aqueous hydrogen chloride. Now that should sound something familiar to you. Aqueous hydrogen compounds are acidic compounds and acidic compounds have to produce ions in solution, in particular, the hydrogen ion. So this guy right here, because it's one of our acids, will actually react with water to produce brand new ions that didn't exist in the compound. So for now, we just identify this as ionization and we would create H plus ions in solution and Cl minus ions, the associated anion. Remember that shortcut I was telling you about in the Chem 10 review? Whenever you have a hydrogen containing compound, if you have uh, hydrogen compounds, we just pretend that they are ionic and everything works out. 
This is another example of that extension to just kind of make it a little bit easier for you. So there's your ionization equation. At this point in the unit, dissociation and ionization look the same, but they are different processes and we do include it above the arrow. All right, so there's your definitions for it. Here's a few examples. Why don't you try silver fluoride before you look at the next video. I'll take you through the next five and then we can take a look at the practice assignment that goes with 5.2.